This video is called Mutual Benefits, the Potential of Disabled People as Foster Carers. And the first person to speak is Dr. Peter Unwin, Principal Lecturer from the University of Worcester. My name is Peter Unwin, I'm a Principal Lecturer at the University of Worcester and I was very pleased to be involved in this research project with colleagues from Shaping Our Lives Disability Network and the Foster Care Cooperative. We applied for big lottery mo money through um, Drill and we made a case that there was a missing voice in foster care of disabled people and we wondered why this was so, particularly as fostering has in recent years uh, become much more diverse and recruited people from different backgrounds in terms of ethnicity and sexuality but um, again despite the fact that many disabled people are themselves parents we hardly could think of a disabled person acting as a foster carer and we hope that um, the film that follows will illuminate the voice of disabled people and point to, the, to a future where we'll see disabled people included as foster carers alongside everybody else from all walks of life. The next person to speak is Becky Meakin, General Manager at Shaping Our Lives Service User and Disabled Persons Network. When we started looking at um, disabled people and their potential to become foster carers, um, we realised very quickly that there were very few disabled people in the fostering workforce. So I think it's partly because disabled people have not appreciated that they um, are equally, if not um, in some cases, more qualified to enter into the fostering workforce um, than other people, but also because the agencies have not been um, as inclusive in their practice as they should have been to enable disabled people to feel comfortable and confident about approaching. The following interviews feature disabled people who work as foster carers and their support staff. The first person you'll hear speak will be Alison, foster carer for Liverpool City Council. So um, I became interested in fostering following um, some voluntary work that I did. Um, so first of all I approached um, three different agencies originally um, and was turned down um, almost straight away by them due to being a wheelchair user. Um, so I actually left it a while before um, trying something else um, and approached Liverpool City Council. Um, luckily Liverpool City Council were quite different um, and positive about what I could offer to a looked after child. Um, so I went through the recruitment process with them um, which was quite supportive and positive again. Um, so I got approved as a foster carer three years ago now. Um, I began my role with two easier placements, perhaps with younger children, um, and they were short term. I now have um, a child who was considered very difficult to place. Um, and was about to be placed out of the Liverpool area due to extreme behaviours and her own special needs. Um, she's now been with me over two years, is placed with me permanently um, and is doing fantastically well. She's turned around her behaviours, she's settled in school, she's doing well out of school with her interests and hobbies um, and it's just um, really worked for both of us. The next person you'll hear speak is John Pelton, foster carer for the National Fostering Agency. How long have you been a foster carer? Uh, just eight years. Eight years and three weeks. And how do you think your disability has affected you working as a foster carer? Uh, it, it puts limitations on me, it, I, and you know, you, to, you always manage your limitations. I don't think it affects what I do. It affects, in some ways, the things I can do. Um, you know, I can't necessarily run around the park and play football with the children, but what I can do is facilitate them going to the park and playing football. Or I can take them to football coaching. And I can. So I don't think it really affects what I do in any way. I don't allow it to. Okay. And how did the foster agencies you originally approached view your disability? A little bit mixed, actually. Um, the first one 
outright rejecting me um, in terms of without doing any assessment rejecting me without coming and even speaking to me or looking at me or meeting me or seeing what my capabilities were outright rejected me right. um, a local authority didn't really engage um, so it's been a little bit mixed you know I, I came to a different a different path into fostering through a different agency who were, were marvellous so it's a little bit mixed the next person to speak will be Ian Owens, Supervising Social Worker for the National Fostering Agency Group. And have you made any adjustments in your organisation for uh, working with John, who I believe has a disability? Uh, yeah, we have. So we've looked at the, the, the training venues as one example um, that we use across the, um, the area where John lives um, to, to try and make them accessible wherever possible. And we've, that's led to moving a few venues um, so it's easier access for people. We're looking at the terminology we use on the website as well, um, looking at the case studies we use to try and promote to people um, that, that fostering is a, is a possibility for, for people with disabilities. The next person speaking will be Linda from the Oldham Council Fostering Service. I've been a foster carer for 28 years and I lost my sight six years ago, literally overnight. Um, I've not lost all my sight. I'm severely sight impaired, so it has allowed me to carry on fostering. Um, I've had to make quite a few changes to the way that I foster and the ages that I foster. Um, obviously because I can't run around after the toddlers like I used to do. Um, can't keep them safe in the park and things. Uh, with the babies, it makes a difference in the way that I make the bottles up. I bought a special kettle that only pours one lot of water out at a time into a bottle so I don't burn myself. I buy bottles that have got quite dark markings on so I can see the measurements. And it seems a bit silly but I'm very careful what clothes I buy because of buttoning the buttons up and I've had babies with poppers here, there and everywhere and almost back to front. But they don't mind. Um, I'm not as good at being outside as I used to be at taking babies for walks but I've got a very good family and we tend to do it all together. Now Lisa Lawson, Recruitment Officer from Oldham Council Fostering Services, will give her views about recruiting disabled people. As part of the research project we launched a marketing campaign aimed at targeting disabled people direct and getting them to think about um, becoming foster carers. Uh, to do this we used a variety of, of imagery. Um, the main one we used was um, disabled and we emphasised able in the wording just to see that we saw the potential in people who live with a disability. Um, we also had a second set of artwork which was disability which again emphasised the ability. Um, and it was just basically challenging disabled people's perceptions and getting them to think what they can do and what, what instead of what they can't do and ruling themselves out. Um, and we feel it's worked quite well and um, it's very much an ongoing campaign really what we're going to do over the next few years. Next to speak will be Gail Granger, Supervising Social Worker for the Foster Care Cooperative. I think our general awareness of uh, people with disabilities and what they can bring to fostering has really increased through uh, the project. Um, so that's sort of generally the, the, the social workers that are involved and also the management so that we can look at assessments in a much more kind of favourable light. Practically, uh, we've looked at our premises and we've actually um, introduced uh, something to help on the IT front for people that perhaps have trouble accessing um, uh, computer web pages. So we've uh, introduced an access button that would help them to do that. The next speaker is Carrie Marsh, Managing Director of Match Foster Care. We, we recognise we're just at the start of this project, but already we have recruited foster carers who have disabilities. Um, they offer no lesser service to the children that they're caring for than our foster carers who don't have disabilities. In fact, what we found is that in a lot of cases, People who've lived with a disability all their lives have a level of resilience that maybe others don't. We've got foster carers who don't drive and we're willing to put lots and lots of practical support into get, helping them get around. And we have disabled foster carers who can do that independently. So what we're looking for is people 
who are nurturing and loving and can keep children safe and we will fill the gaps where needed. We will now return to hear some more comments from John Pelton, foster carer for the National Fostering Agency. So why then do you think there are so few disabled foster carers in the workforce? I think it's lack of engagement to be fair. I think that over the years there's been there's a reluctance for agencies and local authorities to engage with disabled people. I think there's just it's just not happened yet. I think there's such a massive potential for people with disabilities to change fostering to be a massive positive impact on it. They've just not been engaged with, I think, through fear or through lack of lack of resources or many options. But I think there's definitely a massive there's a massive market of people there, there's a massive pool of talent there that could make a massive impact on fostering. There is now a slide stating the conclusions of the mutual benefits study. Point number one, positive examples of disabled foster carers have been found. Point number two, disabled foster carers have proved effective and resilient. Point number three, discriminatory attitudes exist among professionals. Point number four, deaf and disabled people's organisations have not been proactive in this study. Point number five, there is much confusion about benefits or access to work eligibility. Point number six, there are no national guidelines about recruiting or retaining disabled foster carers. Point number seven, fostering agencies are missing large scale opportunities for recruitment. The next slide is entitled, what needs to be done in the future? Point one, there needs to be effective reach out to disabled people and their organizations. Point two, fostering professionals need training in disabled issues such as social model of disability, benefits issues, and the use of outside resources. Point three, disabled foster carers need to be championed by their agencies. Point four, there needs to be monitoring and recording of disabled applicants and the number of conversions to becoming foster carers. Point five, a best practice guide needs to be produced. And finally, point six, there needs to be a national rollout of these findings tracking progress from first point of inquiry.